Hi everyone and welcome to the next installment of Psych Health and Safety Live. Uh, I'm one of your hosts, Jason Van Chee, and with me today I've got Joel Mitchell. Hey today, Joel. Tired. <laughs> yeah, you, you've been tired for a bit. Just... No, this is like extra tired. I just couldn't sleep last night. So Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, that late latent first night effect after moving into your temporary accommodation. Um, I don't know what it was. Just, yeah, I think the room was a bit hot maybe. Yeah, okay. Yeah, crank those air cons. Yeah. Yeah, global warming's happening with or without that, right? So <laughs> it's all right. Uh, so, look, you are tired. Um, mm. You have had a Red Bull about I have. A, an hour ago. You're probably crashing now, right? You had the up and now you're having the uh, down. No, I'm not, I'm not crashing. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll just do our best. Yeah. <laughs> Listeners, grit your teeth. It's going to be a rough one. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who are new to the live format, uh, basically every Tuesday, Joelle, Alicia or myself will jump on uh, and discuss some of the issues raised in the Monday podcast. Uh, the Monday podcast this week was from Louise Aston from Business in the Community about their report, What If Your Job Was Good For You? Imagine that. Imagine. Just mm. imagine. <laughs> hey, your job's pretty good. My job is pretty good. Yeah, it's, you know, my, my jobs tend to be pretty good because, you know, I'm there. So the way we, we run these things is a little bit more informal, as you can probably tell already from the start of this podcast. Um, basically, we will have a rough agenda. Uh, we do encourage questions throughout rather than waiting to the end, although we will open it up for uh, a formal Q&A at the end if there are any questions. Uh, last time we had about 30 people uh, rock up at some point during the one hour feed. So thanks to those listeners and hopefully we have some um, uh, repeat visitors this time. Um, but just remember if you are watching on LinkedIn that if you want to participate in this, then you'll need to jump over to YouTube and put in your, uh, your questions via the comments box there. Um, but Really, if we move into the agenda now, uh, what we're uh, talking about is that report. And really, I want to focus in on the two calls to action from the report. The first was to achieve parity between the management of physical health and safety and mental health and safety uh, with an open and accountable culture. And the second call to action was to enable employees to create their own good jobs supported by managers and aligned with organizational practices and policies. So if we jump into the first one straight up, Joel, um, and looking at that increasing parity, um, one of the statistics, um, or there was a statistic that Louise mentioned, what was that one again? Yeah, so basically um, they run an annual survey um, and they've had sort of this, um, this particular statistic has been increasing sort of each year. Um, where they've asked people, you know, have they had psychological injuries that have been caused or worsened by work in the past 12 months? So that figure has been gradually increasing. But um, in 2020, 41% of people reported that, yes, that was the case, that they'd had a psychological injury that was either caused or exacerbated by work. Yeah. And, and one of the things I talk about in that report is imagine if we heard that 41% of like there was 41% of employees who had a physical injury occur from the workplace, um, there'd be a massive outcry. Yeah, and I think um, it's, for, for, for I guess, for the naysayers out there to get out in front, um, you know, when we're talking about psychological injury, we're talking about people who are approaching a, a level of di diagnosable disorder. We're not talking about people who have felt a little bit upset or a little bit stressed. So, you know, we're, we're not talking about the equivalent of a paper cut. Um, if, if we're looking at analogies, we're talking about something that would be a um, more, than, more than a first aid case. So we'd be talking about something that would be a medical treatment case um, from, a, from a physical safety perspective. Yeah. And that 41% stat sounds pretty high, you know, um, injuries caused by or um, exacerbated by but it is in line with other reports that have been published in recent times. Yep. Yep. So the HSC, for example, uh, their labour force survey um, from the data that came out just pre-pandemic, or I think um, if you speak to Peter Kelly, you'll say it was a week into the pandemic, that reporting period. Um, in that 12-month period, there was 17.9 million days lost due to work-related stress, depression and anxiety. So that was actually 46% uh, of all non-fatal injuries and illnesses 
uh, accounted for by work-related stress, depression, and anxiety. And in uh, in Australia, um, uh, we've got some stats that show in the four years um, preceding um, COVID that there was about a 50% increase in psychological injury claims. Now, they are compensable uh, claims versus you know, people self-reporting that they took time off due to work-related stress, depression, and anxiety, which is obviously harder. Yeah, well, absolutely. And it's um, depending on um, which state in Australia you live in, um, the ease of actually getting a psych claim um, assessed as being compensable um, can be quite difficult. Um, and then there's also just a whole lot of disincentives around claiming workers' compensation anyway because it's something you have to declare potentially on future job applications and all of that sort of thing. So um, that, yeah, that figure of um, compensation would be, you know, a, a very conservative reflection of actual figures of um, work-related psychological illness. Yeah. So um, just to show how big the gap is, um, when we look at Safe Work New South Wales statistics, their workers' compensation stats that they brought out at the same time they brought out their draft code of practice. Now, for those of you who haven't been following along, uh, their code of practice now is in its final state, has been published now. But the statistics that came out in September last year um, were that in the four years preceding 2019, uh, there was a 53% increase in psychological injury claims versus just three and a half percent for physical injury claims. Um, so it looks like physical injuries are, you know, trending pretty steady. Um, three and a half percent over four years, you know, is, is pretty small, um, but 53% increase, obviously, similar to what Safe Work Australia uh, found across the whole country's workers' compensation stats. So, you know, massive, massive difference in what we're seeing there. The issue is, of course, when people make these psychological injury claims, they're generally a lot more complex than physical injury claims and therefore require longer times off work uh, with the average amount of time off work, almost half a year now, um, versus a physical injury claim, which is about, you know, quarter, quarter that amount. Mm. Um, Mark uh, fr from uh, Oman, he, he came along last time. Hello. Good to see you, Mark. Um, yeah, they don't have as good a data over there. So um, not, not quite sure what the numbers are over there. Uh, I believe UK, Australia, Canada are all, all pretty similar, similar numbers that we're seeing. Yeah, and certainly from a um, population perspective as well, the numbers are all fairly similar that in any 12-month period you'll have 20% of um, working age adults experience a diagnosed disorder, psychological yeah. disorder, and over a lifetime um, approaching 50% of the population will experience that. So yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's pretty consistent across those um, those different countries. So I don't think there's any reason to expect that that would be different elsewhere. Yeah. So um, you used to work for a regulator, Joel. I did. Yeah. Yes. So would you have any insights into why you believe um, psychological health and safety is lagging so far behind how we manage physical health and safety? Um, I have plenty of opinions. That's what we're here for. As I do, I always have opinions. Um, these opinions are purely my own and are not reflective of any employer, current or present. Um, you can speak on, or, current, can speak current on behalf previous. Of, I can, of people diagnostics. I can. Yeah. All right. So what I'm giving you now is Jason's opinion on things. Um, <laughs> right. So um, complex is, I guess, the word that I would use initially. So um it's, yeah, look, it's a lot more difficult to prove a lot of the time that a psychological injury is a consequence of work. Um, and a lot of the time it's a consequence of a combination of work and not work factors. And we get, you know, we get to a point where a threshold is reached and we become unwell. Um, so I suppose you could look at it like something like sun exposure and cancer. Um, you know, we know that um, there's a relationship between sun exposure and cancer um, and we can, you know, um, as an employer, reduce people's exposure to the sun during their work hours, but we don't have any control over their exposure to the sun during the home um, or non-work time. Um, so it could be argued from an employer's perspective that if an employee did develop skin cancer as a consequence of sun exposure, um, it's difficult to prove that that is as a result of work and not mm. what they were doing in their home time. So I think that there's probably a similar argument that has been made about psychological injury um, where you could say, well, yes, but, you know, the hazards that they were exposed to at work 
um, we're not at a level that would um, predictably cause a psychological injury. There were other things going on outside of work that contributed to that and overwhelmingly the cause of the injury was more related to the things going on outside of work than at work. So I think that that's probably the argument that has typically been put forward by employers um, and, you know, it's incredibly difficult for an employee to prove um, that that something was the cause was caused by work factors, um, unless you've got you know a particular event or series of events happening at work, you know bullying, um, assault, you know those kinds of um, really significant events um, that very clearly happen at work, as opposed to that sort of gradual just erosion, grinding down that happens over time. Um, you know, you're just chronic exposure to low level hazards. Mm. Um, and I guess the other, so th- from, from the other side of that, then from the regulator side of things, um, you know, it's, it's resources, you know, what do we actually have the resources to address? Um, you know, regulators, when they're deciding what do they want to pursue and what do they want to prosecute? Um, you know, a lot of it comes down to what is the, um, what is the public prosecutor actually likely to want to pursue? Um, and then, you know, the decision to then investigate with a view to potential prosecution, and that's a whole different ball game to just investigating to sort of determine whether you need um, improvement notices or whatever. Um, they're two very different ball games there. So, you know, investigation with um, a view to prosecute um, is yeah, very much going to be based on is this something that the public prosecutor is likely to want to pursue based on, you know, their existing caseload of all of the stuff that they're looking at. Um, So, you know, unless you're looking at really, really severe psychological hazards that are causing mass severe disablement across the workforce, you're probably unlikely to meet that threshold where the public prosecutor is going to feel justified in actually pursuing that. Um, and again, getting sufficient evidence to actually get to a point where you can um, present a sufficient case to the prosecutor is difficult also. Yeah, no, very difficult to prove, as you say, which obviously is why many people um, skip the whole workers' compensation route and go straight to TPD. Uh, when making an insurance claim for a mental disorder. Actually, just to clear up some of our terminology, uh, Amari asks, is it a psych injury or a disorder? So a psych injury is something that's occurred at work. Um, Typically, it would be a mental disorder, right? And you'd have to uh, demonstrate a major work component in the development of that disorder. Yeah, I guess it's it's different language, but you're essentially talking about the same thing. So if you're a clinical psychologist or if you're looking at, for example, the DSM, Um, you're going to be talking about a psychological illness or a psychological disorder. Um, But if you're a workplace, then you're talking about a psychological injury. Yeah, and it's um, preventing someone from being able to work. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, Conrad uh, has an interesting take on it. He says, when we see a a physical injury such as a broken bone, we don't question the strength of the bone. However, when it comes to a psychological injury, employers tend to question the strength of the person's brain. Yep. Um, So, and... Uh, a good analogy that um, I heard from a client recently, and I was a little bit jealous actually that I didn't come up with it myself, was, um, you know, different people have different capacity to lift weights. Um, you know, I probably can't lift as as significant a weight as maybe Jason can. Um, but if I were instructed to lift a weight that was beyond my capacity and then was injured as a result of that, um, that wouldn't be my fault for not being strong enough to um, to be able to carry that particular weight. Yeah. But there has been a focus, I guess, and it's probably the whole wellness or wellbeing movement or EAP movement where it's been more of a focus on individuals and symptoms yeah. um, and making We've, people more resilient. Yeah, resilient. We've given you tools to be resilient and if you're not using them, then that's your problem not ours yeah and you've talked about it before on the podcast how essentially it's the employer pushing down the ownership of risk to the individual yeah and that's not something that's unique to psych health and safety that's something that happens in um you know in the physical safety environment all the time um 
uh, yeah, that's that's a whole that's a whole separate rant that I'm not going to um to start down. But look, it's a it's a really common um, pathway for organisations to take, um, you know, and we can really talk about also the influence of power in in this whole um, dynamic as well. Um, and again, that would probably take up our whole hour. Uh, <laughs> but it's uh, it's a really really important element, this element of power. Um, and it's really often not discussed when we're talking about things like safety, safety culture, um, or, you know, just culture, all of those sorts of things. Uh, and I guess um, the amount of power employees have depend on a number of different factors. Um, the state of the economy is one, right? So if there's not a lot of jobs around, then they might not feel they can speak up. Um, Danielle from the UK says that people are starting to vote with their feet now. And if uh, employers aren't supporting them, they're looking for employees that will. Yeah, definitely. And I think um, we're seeing a lot of that probably in hospitality. Um, in just, I guess, a lot of the stories that I that I read and, you know, stories coming out of the US where literally just staff at um, fast food restaurants are just walking out because the, the conditions that they're exposed to versus the pay that they're getting um, isn't worth it. Um, and I think you know, living through the events that we've lived through in the last 18 months, um, people potentially start to view um, how they're spending their time in a different way, um, you know, and is it is it actually worth it or not? Mm. Helen um, from Melbourne has brought up something that I've seen quite a bit actually. Um, she's saying if employers are concerned about risk of liability, does this prevent them from lifting the lid? opening up Pandora's box, if you like, by asking people what they really think? Um, look, that might be an approach that they're trying to take, um, the idea of plausible deniability. Um, from a regulator's perspective, that doesn't fly. Mm. Um, you know, we we know that psych hazards exist. Um, we know the impact of psych hazards. There's a wealth of academic research on, you know, um, work factors that, influence psychological health and safety, um, you know, what, what's appropriate control measures, all of that sort of thing. So um, just pretending or, or deliberately avoiding knowledge of the presence of those hazards in your workplace doesn't absolve you. Um, you have a duty to actually identify those hazards um, and then do something about it. So you don't take the first step of identifying the hazards. That doesn't absolve you of your responsibility. Yeah, and we've actually been speaking to some clients recently um, and, you know, uh, around Australia, regulators are starting to um, create action and starting to issue improvement notices, not because that there has been necessarily a psych injury occur um, or that, you know, an employer has identified a hazard and hasn't done anything about it, they haven't taken the first step. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah, look, a lot of what um, safety regulators will, will look at is do you have systems of work in place to identify your hazards and manage them appropriately? Um, so it's not just about, you know, how do you react once, um, once somebody's injured, but do you actually have systems of work in place that create a safe and healthy workplace as far as is reasonably practicable? Yeah. Now, um, uh, what the next question we had on our agenda is there are, is there a movement towards increasing emphasis on psych health and safety? And I think there's a number of recent examples that are. So that one that I mentioned about some regulators starting to issue improvement notices to companies, not yep. necessarily because of a complaint, um, but because they don't have safe systems of work to identify hazards in the first place. Yeah. So just as part of your the, um, the routine um, sort of inspection process that they'll follow, um, if that's selected as a topic that they're going to inspect you on, um, yeah, if you if you haven't got those safe systems of work in place, then you're going to get um, some actions on it. Yeah. Um, what we're seeing in the UK, I remember reading an article recently about um, the Union for Higher Education um, getting in touch with the HSC and saying, look, we want you to investigate um, psych risk factors in this environment. And they're not talking about bullying and harassment. They're just talking about, um, you know, over um, demanding work requirements. So yep. work workload. So, um, you know, uh, actually unions and regulators working together in specific industries. Um, interestingly, that the business and the community report, remember that's what we're discussing today, um, they came up uh, with the idea that we needed to increase parity between the way we manage psychological health and safety to bring it in line with how we manage physical health and safety. They did that independently 
of knowing the Productivity Commission's inquiry into mental health in Australia. So last year, if you uh, didn't catch it, uh, the Productivity Commission um, published this report, mainly looking at the economic impact of um, poor mental health in, in Australia. Um, and they um, mentioned a number of key reforms to address it. And uh, out of five key reforms, one was around workplace mental health. And it wasn't about giving people more access to mindfulness apps. Uh, it was about you know, increasing uh, the role of psychological health and safety and bringing that parity in. So uh, interestingly, that business and the community would come to the same conclusion um, as what you know has been found in Australia. Yeah, but that, I mean that often happens, though, doesn't it? In um, you know, in other areas of of research, and even if we look into sort of the you know hard science research, you'll often find that two different um, research teams, you know, on opposite sides of the globe, working completely independently of each other, actually arrive at you know sort of similar research questions and outcomes. Yeah. Um, so I think there's just a an element of it, you know, it's the right time um, in our history now for this to happen. Yeah, and uh, definitely a little thing called COVID, I think, um, and the focus that's put on mental health and, you know, creating supportive work environments, um, I think is definitely going to help with that, that movement towards yep. more systemic approaches. Yeah, absolutely, yep. Mm. Um, the Productivity Commission's uh reform, suggested reform, is actually aligned and probably came from uh, the Boland Review into the WHS Act here in Australia, uh, where she recommended, and out of 34 recommendations, mind you, this is number two, um, to elevate psychological health and safety in, in regulations. So the WHS ministers in Australia just a few months ago have voted to uh, adopt that. Uh, and obviously then there's a long process between now and actually having that enshrined in, in regulations. But what we're seeing is the state regulators are getting on the front foot and publishing codes of practice. So just in the last week, we've seen WA uh, release their draft code of practice. Now, WA was the first state to introduce a code of practice around um, psychological health and safety, but it was specific to the FIFO industry in 2018. Um, but this one is going to be, this one is industry agnostic. Um, so it is for all uh, employers in, in Australia or in WA. In WA, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But um, we know that Victoria and... Um, and Queensland are definitely drafting codes of practice at the moment, so hopefully they'll be releasing that shortly. Um, South Australia can't be too far behind. I wouldn't imagine so, no. no they're usually a fair bit behind the rest of Australia. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going there. <laughs> to South Only Australia, I mean, because... <laughs> <laughs> They've got nice wine, though. <laughs> they do have nice wine. No, I have, I have been to South Australia, and it's very nice for a visit. <laughs> Okay, um, so what are the things holding companies back from, from acting? And this actually ties in with what Helen commented uh, just before. Um, so the impact of stigma. Um, and that, that could also prevent, obviously, employees from reporting um, a psychological injury versus a physical injury. Um, you know, and like you were saying, that the fact that they might have to carry that into future um, job, interview, job recruitment interview processes as well. Um, if they've had an injury, I know definitely. Um, I remember uh, when I had to get my life insurance updated after my back operation. You know that was something that I had to declare, uh, yep. and you'd have to go through a similar process for a diagnosed mental disorder as well. Yeah, absolutely. So if you don't already have life insurance and you know salary insurance and all of that sort of thing, um, you don't want to be getting a diagnosed psychological disorder before you've got those things in order because you'll be essentially uninsurable. Mm. So um, lots of disincentives. Yeah. So some of the other things holding companies back, um, uh, I think I will, I, I really do believe it, it is employees being ignorant rather than not caring. I think most employers do want what's best for their employees. They want them to go home healthy and happy. Um, but I think there's a lot of misinformation that's out there around how to achieve that. And there is that, you know, prevailing, uh, idea that individuals can solve all of the workplace wellbeing issues on their own if we just make them a bit more resilient or give them access to some digital tools to make them more mindful, uh, practice some yoga, you know, that sort of thing. And the employee's job's done, right? Um, so I think it's largely to do with education. That's obviously why Joel and I have been doing this podcast since the beginning of February, because we feel that there's a lot of education that needs to go out there regarding um the importance take, of taking a psychological health and safety approach. Yeah, look, um, you you probably um, 
you maybe have a more optimistic view of employers than I do. Well, we know I'm always more optimistic than you. Violently optimistic even. <laughs> um, no, look, yes, there are there are employers who do genuinely um, want their employees to be healthy and to uh, particularly to be psychologically healthy just because they're, um, you know, humans. Um, and then you've got employers who can see that it's in their best interests to have um, employees who are psychologically healthy um, and then you've got employers who think that people just need to, um, you know, have a teaspoon of concrete and harden up and um, none of this has got anything to do with the workplace um, and we're, we're, this is just all, um, you know, a bridge too far. So um, we've got, you know, I think lots of different um angles and perspectives and motivations um, for different types of employers and it's about finding the levers or the right threads to pull for each of those different types of motivation. So, you know, for that last group, it, it is potentially just the legal obligations that, you know, you're you're out of compliance with the legislation and these are going to be the consequences for you um, once the job market um, shifts in favour of um employees, uh, you're going to find yourself, you know, having a hard time getting a decent pool of um, candidates whenever you've, whenever you're um, recruiting, you're going to see an increase in turnover because you're just a crappy place to work and nobody wants to be there. And they can see that your competitors are doing a much better job in uh, providing psychologically healthy and safe workplaces. So, um, you know, even if you think that it's all a bit of nonsense, um, it's still in your best interest to do something about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um- one of the other things that I think might be holding um, companies back from acting is this misalignment between what health and safety and HR and people who are, who are wanting to do something in their organisations around mental health and what the board considers is their responsibilities or what the company's priorities are. Um, and one of the things that, you know, has been talked about at nauseum is this ROI um, Thing. And there's been so many reports that have lined the pockets of these big four. Um, <laughs> some really interesting questions coming in at the moment I'll come to in a second. Uh, but they've lined the pockets of these big four consulting firms to, to produce these reports that will talk about the, um, the return on investment that companies can expect to obtain for, for every dollar um, that's invested in workplace mental health initiatives. Um, And it doesn't matter how big that figure is, it hasn't really changed the way that employers go about it, which actually goes back to my assumption that employers think they're doing a good job, but maybe they're not aware of the best practice. I mean, and when you actually look at the methodologies that that are employed, though, and the types of initiatives that are actually evaluated for ROI, they are still those initiatives that are focused on individual health promotion, um, early intervention, those types of things and, you know, giving people training to deal with maybe particular psychosocial hazards. Mm. Um, so, you know, training in how to de-escalate if a customer becomes, you know, starts to become aggressive, like those types of interventions, they're still very much focused on the individual. Um, most of, I, I don't think I've seen any of those reports that have actually evaluated a proper systematic hazard identification, risk assessment, risk reduction, like an OHS risk management approach and the reason for that is that it's really really difficult to evaluate something like that because there are so many different variables at play that it's virtually impossible to say with any degree of certainty that yes x caused y yeah absolutely so um one of the um things that we're going to be talking about on the 7th of september is on our next live panel will be the esg argument yeah so one of the things that is high up on board's agendas at the moment is sustainability um, and they're looking for um, how do they make uh, environmental decisions that are sustainable? How do they make governance decisions that are sustainable? And then the bit that's often missing is the social impact. How are we caring for our employees? And, and I think that's a, a, a trigger uh, for a lot of companies that people who are interested in getting more investment in this, you know, they, they could possibly pull on. Yeah, I mean, it's employees, but also society, right? Because the people who work for you are also part of the community um, who are potentially also your customers. Um, and so it's, it's sort of, um, it, it, it's a, I guess, an ecosystem in and of itself. So, you know, if you're 
investing in the psychological health of your employees, you're also investing in the health of the community that they're a part of. Um, and we know, you know, there's been also lots of studies um, done on the economics of um, psychological ill health, um, sort of, you know, on on national economies and, and that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, from that um, social and economic perspective, there's a big um, driver there for businesses as well. Yeah. yeah. So I'm looking forward to that discussion um, mm. and really unpacking that and particularly this whole idea of social impact measurement as well. So once you've done this, how do you demonstrate that you're doing it well? Yeah. Um, and I don't think, you know, getting a employee engagement number in a uh, wellbeing app uh, is actually going to, you know, meet what shareholders are expecting in terms of um, creating a healthy and um, mentally healthy supporting environment. No, well, that's not giving you any outcome. Like engagement is a predictor of outcomes, but it's not an outcome in and of itself. Yeah. Um, Conrad makes the um, observation that he thinks job demands are increasing and employers are struggling to keep ahead with wellbeing and resilience resources. Um, so we think about the demands resources model, right? You know, we know that um, too high demands and too low resources is a recipe for uh, likelihood that people will have an adverse stress reaction. Um, and there's only so much PPE that we can provide to people. And when I say PPE, I mean self-care resources um, like mindfulness or yoga or fruit bowls and that sort of thing. Um, and at some point in time, we do need to look at ways to reduce the demands. Um, and so obviously job demands are increasing and I really feel for the people at the moment who are in these extended lockdowns in Victoria and, and Sydney and, and the uncertainty and the uh, insecurity and the, the change and, and all the rest, you know, that is causing a lot of stress at the moment. Well, and in other countries that have had it a hell of a lot worse than we have in Australia as well. Yeah. Mind you, I think the Victorians have had the worst lockdowns um, in, the at, world? in the world. Yeah. Even compared to the UK? Even compared to the UK, I do believe so. If you speak to Alicia, um, she, she'll probably have the number. You should probably <laughs> ask her. Um, but th that's the thing, right? These are all additional demands yep. on top of the increasing demands. Remember the, the statistics we were quoting uh, earlier around the degree of work-related stress, depression, anxiety that was out there. That was pre-pandemic figures. And now we've got all these additional um, pressures that are being put on people, which obviously is, is um, you know, an additional risk uh, to their mental health and well-being. So um, one of the things that companies need to do at some point in time is go, well, we can't just provide more wellbeing resources or reactive services as an EAP. I mean, they're all still important. Mm. We do need to look at, you know, how do we actually decrease demands? Yeah, and there's, you know, I guess that's where um, to plug our profession, but, you know, that's where a good organisational psychologist comes into it and in actually looking at, you know, a, a job analysis and, and and saying, okay, well, what are the things that are core to this role? What are the things that are ancillary and can be um, potentially reallocated? Um, what are the things that this this role doesn't need to be doing at all? Um, so it's it's about coming in and, and taking a fresh look at the at the role requirements. What is the what is this position actually doing? Um, and yeah. What do we cut, basically? Yeah. Um, Helen um, asks the question, um, she, well, first of all, she's excited about the shift towards achieving parity between psychological and physical health and safety. Um, how do we make the additional shift from avoidance of injury to the attainment of mentally healthy workplaces? And I think this is where you've got to consider the integrated model of, of workplace mental health. So what we're talking about, particularly when we talk about psych health and safety, is that secondary um, uh, prevention or the prevent harm part of the integrated model. Um, the mitigate illness is uh, where your EAP, mental health first aid, return to work uh, provisions will sit. Um, prevent harm is your risk management, um, um, essentially. And then the other bit is promote flourishing. Um, so what are the things that you're doing to promote the positive? And you can do that um, proactively by incorporating good job design from the outset, you know, knowing that people like, the majority of people like a degree of autonomy, they like, um, you know, demanding but not unrealistic job demands, um, workloads. Meaningful you know, work. Meaningful work, good positive relationships, collaboration. Yeah. Yeah, design work from the outset, you know, like that. Um, that's great. Then you can also talk about all your wellbeing initiatives, use of things like positive psychology, strengths-based approaches. There's yep. a number of things that can fit in there. Yeah, and I think that a lot of those things are already being done by organisations anyway. It's really the, the risk management piece um, that's been missing a lot of the time. Yeah, which is why we're seeing these calls 
from various sources and now business in the community with this report to um, yeah really elevate that prevent harm bit the mm. the risk management um, side of things. Mm. Um, so one of the the other recommend so sorry first of all when we just to conclude that part when we're talking about the um, actions the key actions what would they call them again? <laughs> uh, principles. principles, principles to guide action. Yeah, or oh, not that yet. No, the no. Um, the key actions, the call, uh, the calls call to, to action. action. That's the one. So the the first call to action was that increasing the parity. Um, the second um, key action was enabling employees to create their own good jobs, yep. supported by managers and aligned with organisational practices and policies. So I just wanted to switch over to that now. Now, when we're talking to Louise about this, um, we mentioned that this is what we call job crafting. Yep. Yeah, so the ability for employees to um, proactively and independently to be able to craft, thinking about the psychological factors in the workplace, a job that kind of meets their ideal. Because you'll find not all employees, you know, want the same amount of workload. They won't want the, require the same amount of autonomy as their colleagues. Everyone will be slightly different. And so really um, it's about then the individual be giving the, uh, the freedoms and flexibility with the support of management to be able to craft the job that kind of suits their ideal. So there's, we, we talk a lot about the systemic, like what can be done at a systems level um, uh, to suit or to protect the majority of employees. But then because of individual differences, this is where I think job crafting is really useful to kind of make sure that everyone is kind of living their best lives when they're at work. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and this is really where the um, relationship between the supervisor and the employee uh, becomes really important. Um, supported by appropriate sort of um, policy at an organisational level um, to allow employees that flexibility um, where that's reasonable. Um, so understanding, you know, what your employees are interested in and what capacity they have and offering them opportunities um, when those come up. Um, I think we've got really strong ties between this and, um, you know, organisational citizenship behaviours. Um, so, you know, things like... Um, when you've got, you know, if, if you're implementing a, a new psych health and safety initiative and you've got a working group, you know, you've got some employees who are really interested in doing that, um, freeing up some of their time so that they can participate in that. You know, that's an example of, um, of job crafting um, where you're able to step outside of your um, sort of predefined um, job description and participate in something that you that you're interested in, um, that you feel is um, adding value for yourself and the organisation and something that you can potentially, you know, grow your skills and, and get that sort of sense of purpose and meaning as well. Yeah, the, um, the double-edged sword, as, as Conrad refers to it as, is the fact that sometimes when we're really passionate about something, then we can overextend ourselves. Um, so we might take on additional responsibilities or put our hand up to be involved in a, a project when we already have a high workload. Um, which overextends us and can yeah, burn us out. Yeah, so again, that's that's why that um, partnership between the um, the employee and the supervisor is so important um, and that you can actually have those um, frank and honest conversations about workload um, and, you know, is yeah, is this a project that you can actually take on now? Do we have the capacity to reallocate some of your work to somebody else or is it just something that you can't do right now? Yeah. Yeah. So... Um, you, when you were in your a, pre, a previous role, um, you said that you had to do a lot of job crafting. Yeah, um, had to or chose to, um, but yeah, I think a lot of a lot of my job was, um, or what it became, was me basically just sticking my nose into um, conversations <laughs> that were happening around the organisation and. Um, giving my opinion on things um, until people got used to me doing that and realised that, um, oh, this person has something valuable to add um, and then eventually I would be actually proactively invited into those conversations. Um, so, you know, a lot of that was because um, within my role I had the freedom and the permission to be able to do that. Um, I had a level of autonomy um, and independence as a um subject matter specialist um, and the only subject matter specialist in that particular field. Um, so I guess, yeah, there was there was that flexibility um, within my role that enabled me to do that. Uh, but that was also then, you know, something that I actively sought out and did 
because it was something that I wanted to do. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you think maybe prevents people from being able to job craft in their role? Um, oh, there's, there's lots of, lots of things. Um, so I think that when, when you've got really, really strict, um, silos, organizational silos in place, um, even, you know, within your, even within a particular team, you know, if the boundaries of what that team is responsible for are so um, rigid, um, it can be really difficult to job craft um, outside of that outside of that team, mm. um, where you've got a job that is quite um, repetitive, I guess. Um, you know, thinking about maybe like a. to use a terrible example now, but like, you know, a, a checkout operator or something like that. Like if that's the only the only job that you've got in, in your employment at a supermarket, um, it could be difficult to um, to find ways to do any job crafting there um, outside of, I guess, reframing the way that you think about your job mm. in terms of providing a service for people. And I guess you could do some job crafting in the way that you interact with your customers um, the way that you interact with your colleagues, um, that those types of things. So I think that they're ev- even in those really rigid, and I'm just talking as I'm thinking now, but even in those really rigid structured jobs where you don't actually have a lot of autonomy or flexibility, I think there are still those those opportunities to exert your personality a little bit and um, do do something, I guess. Yeah, it might surprise the listeners that I have done a fair bit of uh, checkout operation work myself uh, for about five years when going through university. I um, yeah did some time on the checkout as well as working in a liquor store. Um, but I would, Joel's going to be really surprised to hear this, but um, I'm mildly competitive. And so what I would do uh, would actually be, because you could actually get your scan rate, like how quickly do you scan oh stuff? Oh my goodness. And my, I would, and it wasn't it, what was your error right oh no 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 i wasn't like doing a bad job i still would pack the bags properly right mm-hmm. back in the day when you'd have to pack the bags as well as scan the items yeah um but it was just like how quickly can i do this and i'd go up to the office at the end of the day uh, at the end of the shift and ask what was my scan rate and it was just something that i challenged myself on right? i wasn't competing against anyone else i just <laughs> wanted to know what my scan rate was so um yep. you know there are there are there are things right and so um i think gallup actually have competitiveness as a strength in their strict strength finder tool the via doesn't have a competitiveness <laughs> character strength. yeah that's that's one of those double-edged strengths <laughs> i think yeah yeah if yeah. uh if um yeah my, my son definitely takes after his old man that way uh it's quite competitive um but you know even things like um maybe there's not the flexibility in terms of start and finish times because you're working a particularly rostered shift um, but maybe when you like to take a break in your shift, that might be something that you could talk to your manager about and and could be accommodated. Um, so there is some flexibility there mm. around autonomy, around at least the timing of work or breaks versus how you do it. Although in saying that, you know, I just gave an example of how I did it within the rules. It was like, well, let's do it fast and, and neat. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but um, really, you, you do need a lot of support from managers, and I think trust is a big part in this. And and I think pre-pandemic, um, before working from home, and Louise actually mentioned this, and it was actually part of a clip that we put up today, um, where she talked about working from home or shirking from home. Mm. Um, and I think pre-pandemic, most, or well, I'd, I'd say there'd be quite a large number of line managers that would be thinking people are just, you know, taking a piss, um, and they're not really going to be as productive when working from home. And I think a lot of people have been really surprised at how much has still been able to be accomplished and productivity hasn't really dropped as significantly as what people have thought it would. Yeah, well, wasn't it um, a couple of years ago that, um, was it the CEO of of Yahoo just like unilaterally cancelled all um, remote working arrangements because some people were taking advantage? So it was just like, no, we're just going to, cancel it across the board and everybody has to has to work in the office yeah um i may have got the company wrong it was one of those ones yeah um but yeah i mean that's that's a really lazy approach like if you yeah if you've got employees who are taking advantage 
then you performance manage those employees. You don't just remove the benefit across the board. It's really, really lazy management to do something like that. Yeah. So I think what um, the working from home experiment has taught us is that, you know, we can give trust to the majority of employees and we're not going to see, you know, um, big changes in productivity and where productivity maybe drops, maybe that is um, counter countered by the fact that you have more loyal uh, employees that put in um, more discretionary effort. Well, and I think that that's an important point as well is that, you know, especially for knowledge workers, you're going to have peaks and troughs in your workload mm. um, and that's that's normal and healthy. You can't just be at peak all of the time because that's when you get burnout. Um, and so I think one of the real benefits that you get from um, remote work as a, as a knowledge worker is that you can take advantage of the troughs um, and then you've actually got the capacity for the peaks when they come. And so I think that that really requires a significant shift um, in mindset for a lot of employer, employers who still are really set on that, you know, um, bums in seat for X hours of the day equals productivity and that's just not the case and we know that that's not the case. Yeah, that focus time, like people can be so much more productive um, than that time where you're kind of like searching for inspiration and funnily enough, Conrad's just made the comment, as I mentioned it earlier, you know, um, when he worked from home, he worked longer hours out of guilt for not being on site. So um, there is that discretionary effort. That's discretionary effort that we're yep. talking about. You know, the the company isn't enforcing that. It's someone going, well, maybe my productivity is down, so I'm going to work a bit longer in order to make up for the fact that I'm not being as productive in the office. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of that is engendered by trust and we need you know, managers to to provide that trust and, you know, where em individual employees take advantage of that, then like you say, that's when their performance managed, but you don't then punish the whole organisation by removing that benefit. No, and, you know, treat your employees like adults, you know. They are adults. They deserve to be given the benefit of the doubt. Um, don't, don't, um, yeah, don't treat them like they're 13 years old. Yeah. So another thing I think that's really missing in the puzzle if job crafting is really going to take off is um, competence of line managers. Yeah. Um, understanding and having the vocabulary around the work-related factors um, like autonomy and, you know, relationships and workload and, and all the rest. Um, and, you know, having those discussions with employees regularly, like what is your workload right right, right now? Is it is it good? Is it pressing? Is it causing you distress? You know, is it? what could we be doing? Yeah. Yeah. And as an employee, I guess, um, you know, when you do get given a new task to say, all right, well, this is my current workload. Um, if you want me to do this, then something else has to give. So what's it going to be? Yeah. So you don't, you don't actually have to take on the responsibility of managing all of that workload, put it back on whoever's responsible and say, okay, you tell me what my priorities are and you tell me what's going to give here because I can't do all of it. Yeah. Um, and I've got to say the employees in the People Diagnostics Office are very good at this. Whenever I come up with a genius new idea, they're like, great, well, I'm doing this, this and this. So um, what are you going to give up to get that? <laughs> so, so Genius. Genius. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we call it the cost of change or, you know, scope, scope creep is what they call it when I start adding new things to their workload. and then Well, it, it depends. Sometimes it's scope creep and sometimes it's Jason had a, had a completely – Random idea. Genius idea, I think you meant to say. <clears throat> no, no, I didn't mean to say that, not at all. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so it is important to have that trust, the two-way communication, um, you know, the line manager asking what does the employee want and the employee being able to have the vocabulary to know what they want beyond the fruit bowls and the yoga and the corporate massage. Uh, and that's definitely how, something. How many, how many employees actually want fruit bowls and yoga and corporate mass? I don't want some person coming and poking and prodding me while I'm sitting at my desk. Like, yeah, we, no. We know that. We, we know you have a fear of that and hail. Um, <laughs> that's a story for another day. Um, no, it's not, it's not a story for our listeners. <laughs> it may come up again. Um, <laughs> so, but what, what, what we need is, yeah, that, that two-way communication and, um, uh, the respect, I guess, shown on, on both sides that, you know, people want, people are coming in to fulfil a role, to find meaning in their work and, and managers really need to trust and support that person's ability to do that. Yeah, and that goes right up the line as well, you know. Yeah. So if you're a line manager, then you're, you know, it, same goes for your 
um, middle manager that you're reporting to as well, you know, all the way up to the, the executive suite. Yeah. Well, Joelle, um, we don't have any burning questions here. Conrad's been doing a lot of work for us in the comments. So thank you, Conrad, Good for on answering you, Conrad. Some, some questions. Oh, actually, no, Dia, Dr. Dia did have a question that I um, said I'd come back to, so better answer it. Um, when I made the comment around um, PPE um, in relation to self-care. So um, what we're talking about here is the hierarchy of controls. Um, the hierarchy is typically used when talking about uh, physical hazards in the workplace and controlling the risk to as low as reasonably practicable. And we know that the most effective way to uh, control a risk, well, first of all, to address a risk is to eliminate it completely. You know, no more hazard. Um, hazard sorry. Yeah. Thank you, Joel. Um, so eliminate the hazard completely. So um, lack of Role clarity, eliminate that, done by giving people good job descriptions and catching up with them regularly to discuss their demands and, and what their role is, then we eliminate that, great. But if we can't eliminate it, then we have to look at um, controls to reduce the risk um, from that hazard. Um, and so we'd look at things like engineering controls, we'd look at substitution, um, we would look at education, administrative controls. Um, the bottom and the most, the least effective control is personal protective equipment. We haven't been able to use any other controls All the other controls haven't been able to reduce the risk satisfactorily enough. So what we're going to do is we're going to mandate that people use personal protective equipment like hard hats or safety goggles or, you know, um, those sorts of things to prevent injury in case something falls on their head uh, or gets in their eye. Um, the equivalent for mental health, because obviously hard hats aren't going to protect your mental health, maybe if you had a brain injury or something like that. Yeah, that's a stretch. It is a stretch. Um, so hard hats aren't a mental health um, PPE. What we're talking about when it comes to mental health, the equivalent is self-care. So we haven't been able to remove the, eliminate the risk of, of uh, work-related stress. We haven't been able to reduce the risk to a low enough level um, that people aren't foreseeably going to be uh, injured due to the hazard exposure. So what we're going to do now is rely on self-care. So we're going to teach people to be more resilient. We're going to ask them to eat more fruit. We're going to ask them to go for long walks on the beach. Drink um, some water. Drink some water, that sort of thing. Um, so we understand that these things are the least effective when trying to reduce the likelihood that someone will be harmed based on hazard exposure. However, they're often our go-to. Um, not, yeah. not to say that they don't have a role. So yeah. um, as one of our upcoming um, podcast episodes will talk about, you know, there are some roles that just are inherently going to be exposed to um, psychosocial hazard as a function of the role. That's literally the requirement of the role is to be exposed to those hazards. Um, so, yes, there's things that that can be done to um, reduce the significance of exposure, the significance of the experience, um, buffering to reduce other stressors on them. So, you know, better relationships with managers, um, all of those kinds of other things that add to the overall load of stress um, but the role of um, personal protective strategies for those particular types of jobs is really really important um, and it needs to be done in a really robust and evidence-informed way um, and it needs to be I think um, uh, yeah a lot more than just your sort of standard course in how to meditate how to be mindful um, how to be resilient, but it's about, yeah, what are, what are my warning signs? How do I recognise when those are in place? Um, how do I know when I've had a really difficult interaction and what are the, um, what are the self-care strategies that I engage in after that difficult um, situation um, and when do I need to seek additional help? So it does actually need to be really, really targeted and not just your sort of generic um, resilience training that, that we typically see. Terrific. Um, I am conscious of time and I actually have to jump onto another podcast immediately after we finish oh, this one. Oh, Mr. Fancy Busy Man. It's a crossover with our spin-off, the UK Psych Health and Safety Podcast. Hi, Sheila. <laughs> the second best Psych Health and Safety the Podcast second, on the, the internet. The second best. Um, but I, uh, Daniela has, from the UK has just asked a question that I think we've got time for. I'm going to take give this one to you, Joel, uh, given your Thanks. background. Do you believe that psychological injuries need to be logged or investigated in the same way as physical injuries? Uh, for example, action findings, uh, or is it too soon to determine the best course of action for them? Yes, they need to be investigated, absolutely. Done. <laughs> Do you want to elaborate on that? 
Yeah, so they need they need to be investigated, but they need to be investigated by people who are appropriately competent to do so, who have skills in empathy, who have skills in trauma informed approaches to investigation. Um, so this isn't going to be necessarily the same people who are conducting your safety investigations. Um, the methods that you use aren't necessarily going to be the same, um, and I guess the level of confidence in the findings aren't necessarily going to be the same either. But, yes, they do need to be reported. They do need to be investigated. Um, Organisational factors need to be identified and addressed and supports need to be put in place um, for those people both during the investigation process and afterwards. Uh, Danielle, a really good podcast episode for you to listen to um, for further information on that is with Bob Stenhouse. Yep. Um, I think it was episode 13. Yeah, it's called memory. A Hitman's Guide to... Workplace Investigations. There we go. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, check it out on the Psych Health and Safety podcast. It was early on, uh, but Bob is one of the, the guys in yep. Workplace Investigations and talks about this trauma-informed approach. Yep. Yep. Fantastic. Um, well, listeners, that brings us to the end of this episode. So I will just quickly mention that, you know, we do this every Tuesday. So if you are listening to the podcast after the fact and you want to join in, uh, Tuesday, 6 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. Uh, we know if you've got young kids like I do that 6 p.m. is probably not a great time because you're probably doing dinner and baths and all the rest. Um but hopefully there's a, a bunch of people out there who can make it. Um, next week on the 24th, uh, Alicia will be joining me again. Um, so Joel will be having the week off next week. So well done, Joel. Not not literally the week off, just I don't currently have any podcast scheduled for next week. That's what Jason means when he says I've got the week off. Don't worry, she's got about five other priorities that she's working on. At least five. <laughs> So um, we really love it. It's been some great questions. Um, uh, thank you all for, for participating in that. Um, don't also uh, also forget, uh, don't forget also that we will be releasing this as a podcast episode on Thursday this week. Um, so that will be episode number 47. Um, you can also watch the video on YouTube if you prefer to watch videos like our friend Vince versus um, listen to the podcast. Uh, while you're over on um uh, LinkedIn, because we will put some uh, short clips on LinkedIn this week as well from this, um, then please, you know, either follow or connect with Joel or myself. We do like to continue the conversation uh, online. And uh, Alicia and I will be looking forward to seeing you all next Tuesday. So thanks a lot, listeners, and we'll catch you next time.